I want to begin with, we're going to have a conversation about the book, and there will be uh, a reading from the original Spanish as well as from the German translation over the course of, 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 of this discussion. Um, but since I take for granted that many of you are unfamiliar with the book, um, and uh, we'd like to initiate you a little bit more closely, and of course there are questions that uh, myself and I assume that other members of the jury uh, as well as you're reading the book, this is our opportunity to actually begin to discuss it at in closer detail uh, with the author as well as with the translator. And so, Fernanda, I wanted to begin by asking you just a, a very simple question, or maybe it's not so simple, uh, about the origins of the book and its genesis. I believe that it was published in, in Spanish in 2017. It appeared this spring in 2019, but if I'm not mistaken, it harks back to 2011, 2012, or what, what, what was the impetus for, for beginning to write it? Well, thank you, Daniel. Um um, hello, everyone. Uh, just want to uh, briefly say thank you to all of you uh, for being here. And thank you, of course, uh, uh, for the, um, the House of the uh, Cultures of the World for this prize. I feel tremendously honored. And uh, actually, I never thought I had a chance with such amazing competitions that, that I had. I was competing with uh, great books, and I'm so happy to be here. Never thought I would be someday in Berlin uh, and talking to an audience in the language of my great-great-grandfather. So, uh, I'm not in German, I, I'm sorry, but um, I'll, I'll do what I can in, in English. Uh, thank you also uh, uh, to um, Bern, of course, and, um, and Matias and Veronica and all the jurors. Uh, thank you. And I want to take, thank briefly, uh, say thank you to uh, Linus Guggenberger, my editor at Bagenbach, for believing in this book in the first place. <laughs> and really convincing the editors to, uh, to, to publish it. And uh, well, I, I wrote this novel because I wanted to understand the darker side of my own soul. And uh, of course I didn't, uh, <laughs> uh, um, I, I didn't understand it. I, I, but um, I, I, meanwhile, I connected with a lot of people and this prize, I hope it's, uh, on, uh, another way of uh, connecting uh, with uh, the people who will want to read the book, who will be interested in reading the book. And thank you for that. And I remember, I forgot the question you asked me. <laughs> no, no, no. So what was the genesis of the book? So once I was in Veracruz, who is it's a, a small tropical city in the, Gulf, in the Gulf Coast of Mexico, and I was reading the local paper and in the... We call it the red note section. It is like the crime section, like true crime stories, and um, describing a really greasy, uh, uh, really, really uh, sordid way. And the principal uh, news was that in, in, in a small village near Veracruz, uh, they there found the body of the witch of the village. And uh, the journalist already knew who was the killer, and, he, uh, and the journalist it was a woman, she explained that it was because uh, the killer um, uh, was uh, afraid that the witch was doing witchcraft on him because there used to be lovers and she wanted back. And um, I, I read this and I said, this is very, very Veracruzanian, um, Mexican journalism, this is so weird and uh, and I will, I will find very strange that the journalist, that the journalist uh, had so much confidence in believing in witchcraft, as, is, as in witchcraft could be a motive for killing somebody. And I thought that could be, that could be a, a great uh, story. And at the beginning I wanted to do a real life story, but it was so dangerous to travel to that uh, small village. Uh, be, for reasons that, that we'll discuss. And uh, I told to myself, maybe to console myself, I said that I could write a, non, a fiction story, uh, or another way of telling the truth, not, not only through journalism, but all, also through the fiction. We can say the truth. And the, well, maybe perhaps since we, this is one feature of the Internationale Literatur Prize, and in particular in the presentations, is the opportunity to share materials, 
So maybe we can test the, the screen to see. You mentioned to me that there was a particular image that, uh, of two policemen in, that you wanted to use uh, for La Matosa? Yeah, for example, um, this is, I call it the um, casting because um, uh, all, all of these uh, were people who uh, committed crimes and show up in this jur journal I was speaking of, this newspaper. And I, I wanted to see, I, I wanted to surround myself with real faces and the real looks and, and, um, uh, and almost the consequences and the story that these people uh, tell. These are really young people uh, who got caught committing crimes. And, and I got to choose a little bit. And this image who's a, for, from a photographer, a Mexican photographer uh, from uh, Veracruz. And um, it, this, it, it depicts, um, th these are two policemen who are uh, walking through this uh, terrain, the, this lot, and they are in search of um, a few kilometers uh, 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 ahead, there they found um, mass graves. Now the thing in Mexico and Veracruz is the mass graves. We have like an explosion of violence, you know, like um, people uh, attacking itself when uh, attacking uh, themselves with uh, machine guns in the street with grenades, like you know, war, real war, and um, and now there are no more um, attacks in the street, but we have we we, we have begin to f to finding um, mass graves of all the per all the people who disappear. Uh, from the last years and this photo was published in the newspaper and I saw this and I said I can't imagine that story being uh, having place in, in, a, in an ambience like this uh, and as I was living in Puebla I was um, I, I, I didn't get the chance to go to Veracruz but I googled map a lot because I wanted to see like the landscape. I, I grew up uh, near these places, but I wanted to have them present, so I googled map a lot. And, um, and these are like the roads of La Matosa, the imaginary uh, town that I, that I created. And it's basically a, a, um, an ensemble of um, small towns that I know uh, near uh, Veracruz. And, um, and well, uh, then I begin to, to write. Yeah, but you also come from a background in journalism, correct? Um, and this is what you did before uh, writing this novel, although you, I think you had doubled and you'd uh -huh. well, written before. Kind of, I never was a journalist. Journalist, uh, I work as an editor in a newspaper. It was That was my first uh, job. But uh, I did what in Spanish, in Mexico, we call crónica. It's mm -hmm. like a literary... Um, uh, reportage, like literary writing, and uh, but it's journalistic, and um, and I basically studied journalism because I didn't want to. In Mexico, normally when you want to be a writer, you study literature, but it's weird because it's more academic, and I wanted to be, you know, like in action in the streets because well, when I was a teenager, I wanted to be a FBI agent, <laughs> like uh, Dana Scully from the X Files. Or, or Clarice Starling from the um, the Silence of the Lambs, you know, but uh, I'm Mexican, so I can be a FBI agent, and I discovered that too late. So <laughs> I became a journalist because I thought it was the closest thing to being a detective in Mexico. Yeah. And then, what was it that about fiction in particular that appealed to you for telling this story? Because of course, you can base your material on actual happenings, but but the path is a very distinct one and a different one? I, I, at first I, I saw this new story and I said, I'm going to that town, I'm talking with, I'm, I'm going to talk to everybody, I'm going to yell and interview the criminals and I'm going to, um, I don't know, uh, see like the, 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 the place where the body was found and I, wa I wanted to write in cold blood, but you know, little, a small town, Mexican town, and I wanted to do that. And, and the story of a, of a woman being killed. Um, and I, I wanted to show how in Mexico a, a woman can get killed by, uh, for nothing and still nothing happens. I wanted to show that. But it was really dangerous, uh, as I was telling you, uh, because these small towns around Veracruz were like the refugees for uh, the criminal groups. They will await there and, and, and attack uh, in the principal city when, when it was necessary. And there were a lots of, uh, you know, eyes and spies, and, and we call them hawks in, in, in Mexico. 
uh, people who are just uh, as the, the leaders and the chiefs of the criminal crime, the, the organized crime are there. They watch who's entering in the town, who's asking questions, who's there. So it wasn't like um, a good idea to go there. And besides, I'm not an accredited uh, journalist. So I couldn't show like, oh, yes, I'm from that newspaper. So I didn't get the chance to do that. And so to uh, console myself, or, or, or I, I thought I could invent all that. I could search inside myself for the, you know, the darker truth we have all inside. Uh, every one of, uh, of us has felt desires uh, of, of violence, of, of wanting to kill somebody, but we have stopped because of our education, our culture, our, val our values. <laughs> and, and I wanted to see what happens when, when when we cross that line, that, that line that society draws, and I wanted to, to figure it out. And for me, fiction is a way to explore all, all, all of that. And it's, it's, take, it's borrowing your own desires, dark desires, but it's also borrowing for what you've read and what you've lived and the movies you've watched and, and, and all the things that surround you. And, and well, that's it. I think um, sometimes uh, fiction it, it works in... Um, um, how do you say, in a, in a deeper way than journalism. I think we'll get to the shape and the language of, of this novel momentarily, because this is actually what makes the reading of it such an exhilarating experience. Um, but I want to maybe begin with one of, well, the central character in the book, who is something of a cipher, and we don't hear that much about her. And it's quite interesting, because even while reading some of the reviews in German that have appeared, um, sometimes it's referred to as die Hexe, but quite often they quote the original Spanish, which I'm going to mispronounce is probably la bruja. Bruja. And so actually I would like to ask a, a question to Angelica in terms of what, what is maybe missing in Hexa, since this is really, a, we'll talk about the character and her place in the book, uh, but, but even why is Hexa, what's lacking? Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, maybe I also just start yeah. with a small thank. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Fernanda for having written this powerful novel and um, mm. that I was able to translate it. Then I wanted to thank Wagenbach Verlag for having believed in this novel and published it. Uh, and uh, our editor, Linus Guggenberger, um, who is the perfect first reader. Don't know where he is now. Um, and who really helped me to improve my, um, as he says, invective, um, my insults in German. <laughs> it's not was not really my uh, my strongest side, and, and <laughs> I had to work a lot on it. Uh, so um, yeah, and um, so thank you to all, thanks to all of them. S thanks also to our community of Spanish translators which is very solidary and they're really some great translators. Um, and I think this prize is a kind of recognition for, acknowledge, acknowledgement for all of them. So um, I want to thank them. And then I have to, a small thank you to my son who is very patient with me and he was while I was translating this. <laughs> um, yeah, so the Hexa, um, La Bruja, that, that is the first, uh, uh, the, the first turning point when you like the, the first sentence uh, Teju was talking about, and the Hexel, the La Bruja also appears at the very beginning of the book, of course. And um, La Bruja in, in, in Spanish is something quite casual. Uh, you would call uh, any woman who is a little bit uh, loud, hysterical, or, uh, or just mean, uh, you call her La Bruja, Que Bruja eres? How, so, uh, and, and, and so witch or hexe is, of course, much stronger. And in, in German, you immediately relate to some um, witch burning. And uh, so, but we, we yeah, it, it's what we have. I couldn't invent uh, a, a word. And at the same time, of course, it's it, it's this meaning of hexerei, of uh, witchcraft. And um, so, yeah, we, we had to work with that, and then there comes uh, shortly after that la, la Bruja Chica, what in German would be die Kleine Hexe, because that's her daughter. And at first I translated it as uh, die Kleine Hexe, because I also f found 
found quite cute, actually. But um, then it's not a book that indulges in cuteness. If you haven't, uh <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it sounded like we could uh, uh, use something cute. But uh, then, together with Linus, we decided that it was just we have this ch children's book, uh, *Die kleine Hexe*, and it's just impossible to use throughout a whole book, um, *Die kleine Hexe*. So we use the Hexen Mädchen. And so this, these are the kinds of um, questions you come to. And it's, and it's an essential one in the novel, because as we were saying, in terms of the character herself, she's really at the very beginning of it and her murder. But we don't, she doesn't speak. She doesn't have a name. Mm -hmm. I, I presume this is intentional. Yeah, um, well, uh, uh, I was telling you, um, the thing I never knew uh, and couldn't invent was the moment of the killing because well, a person had never killed anybody and never been killed, so I couldn't like tell exactly what happens when. So I decided to make that moment silent and to silent the voice of the victim and the murder. So in fact, they are the only. They speak now and then, but they don't really have a narrator, a narrator behind them. So everybody in the novel, they speak of them, of the victim and the killer. And they don't really have a voice because I wanted to leave that. You know, as in the most important characters are the, one, the ones that you have to picture through the voices of others. And with that, I wanted a little bit to honor um, uh, the, um, this way that sometimes we... Um, um, we think it's, 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 it's a low form of, of speaking that is gossip, you know, um, and it's, uh, I, I wanted to um, uh, pretend that the book is like a big gossip uh, told by the voices of women of the, of, of, of the village. I wanted uh, uh, to create that kind of uh, sound and that kind of... Um, you know, when, when you are gossiping around and, and someone is telling you something that you really, really uh, are interested in knowing, or when somebody is spoiling you of, a, I don't know, of a TV series, for example, and you listen with, uh, with interest, I, I wanted to copy that. So that's why also the novel has this structure of long sentences, of long phrases, because I, I wanted to... to to feel like somebody was tell, talking to you in your ear and telling you this whole story about these people uh, who, who you uh, might never know, but who you get to know really, really well. Well, this is a reminder. I was thinking when, when Teju was speaking, uh, this, this, this notion that language can not only save a life, as was affirmed, but the important thing as a reader, and this, this goes far beyond just being on the jury, is that, that it can also make one feel alive, make one feel more alive as a reader. And I think one of the, very, the exciting parts uh, about experiencing this novel is the sophistication of its form in the way that things are unraveled over the course of the novel, and even as they are unraveled, and, and uh, what might appear to be secret or uncertain at the beginning becomes clear, at the same time other things become more obscure and opaque, and there's no satisfaction in the resolution. And that's quite exciting as a reader, as especially as you move towards the completion of the book. Um, and, and the sentences as well. And we'll talk about the sentences in a minute. But I wanted to mention this because you sent also some interesting illustrations about the, the structure and the form. And I was hoping maybe you could share some of these. And obviously, a great deal of thinking went into uh, how you would shape the voices who do speak or the characters that would relate the happenings. I, I, uh, this is like a character study. Um, um, I was playing with, for example, what kind of um, uh, characteristics a witch will have, like psychological, or, or for example, and I, there's another character who, whose name is Norma. It's, it's a really young girl from uh, for, uh, of 13 years old, and uh, her character is kind of uh, like an orphan. So um, I, I don't know. I was just playing around, like what kind of. Um, these are like the main points of the story. It's in Spanish, so there's no spoilers here, I guess. And and like the main characters and what are the these are these are like the whole uh, chapters reduced in sentences, quick sentences, because normally I imagine what happens 
and then I took the time to write, like, like really work. And this is like the beginning, always of the of the story of the of the main. Um, here in in pencil is is a little a map of the village that I created. There is it, it doesn't really exist. Uh, I created uh, uh, for my necessities, right? And um, basically, I I just write a lot of by hand and these ideas, and then I type. And this novel actually was uh, a really bit difficult. It, it, it is my second novel, and I silly me thought that it would be a lot easier because just I had already done a novel, so I was thinking, oh, the second one must be, it has to be easier. And in fact, it wasn't, it was like hell. And I think I needed therapy after, uh, uh, when I finished writing um, Hurricane Season, uh, Saison der Bilderstürme. Okay. Der, der, okay, well, uh, sorry. Sorry for that. <laughs> and um, so it, it took me like uh, two years, but it, actually the writing, writing took me six weeks. And then it was, for me, it's revision, always revision. And, and, and that's why the structure is so tight. And uh, An An Angelica, who I totally forgot to say thank you to because I'm such a, uh, a distracted person. But I, I, I wanted to, uh, uh, to thank her of her great job, the almost impossible job. Uh, you know, when I said that hurricane season was being translated into German, somebody tweeted, like, they should build you a statue because <laughs> Really, it's a very colloquial and um, really verbal uh, book. Uh, it's, it's written uh, in a very vulgar uh, style. And to translate that, all that Mexican flavor into a an, 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 an foreign language, as is German for us in Mexico, is quite a, a task. And, and uh, um, uh, I don't know, taking, taking in consideration all the reviews that, uh, uh, that Linus has sent me, uh, I think uh, you, you did it great, and I'm, I'm so, so, so happy. It's, it's, it's such a, a, a strange feeling to hold a book where you can understand even a word and, and think it's yours. And, it's, and, it is, and, and it is also Angelica's. It is also Angelica's. And that's actually... That's actually And the force and the fury of, of this novel's extraordinary sentences I experienced, of course, in German, which is part of the reason I want to ask you uh, this next question, because you're the one who generated the German, not maybe the material from which it was made, but, but, but the sentences that we read. Um, and what were some of the particular challenges in terms of the gap that exists between the original Mexican Spanish and where you had to ferry it in order for it to arrive in German? Yeah, I, well, I think the, the difficulty was not so much as we were talking about those long sentences and, uh, and the dense, density of, of the text. Um, actually, it, what, makes the, what makes it quite easy to enter, to start with the translation, is when the text has a voice. And uh, this text has a very strong voice and, and a rhythm. And so you, you somehow you can hear something. It's something that seems like an equivalent in, an equivalent in, in, in German, though of course it's, it's completely different, but it sounds like something that could be this if it would be German. It's difficult to explain, but uh, you, you, you create like a, a level between uh, the original language and, and the German, or whatever language is translated to, and, and then you move on, on this level, and you have to change things. Uh, you have to change, uh, like in, in, in Mexican Spanish, all those um, the, uh, the repeating words they, they use just to, um, to just to talk to, and, and as it's a lot of oral language, as uh, Fernando said, so they like for instance <laughs> the word pincher. I, I looked at. I looked it up uh, before uh, this evening, and it appears like 250 times um, uh, through the novel. And we just didn't have this word, and so I have to create something, or sometimes leave it out, sometimes create something else. It's what the, the, uh, the it's something like verdammt, or uh, uh, yeah, I use a or lot magnified of magnified from verdammt. <laughs> 
um, but I can't use it all the time because it would just be too much. So I have to, um, yeah, I d d d yeah, to level down a bit because the German uh, sensibility for uh, f for bad language is is lower. Um, and if I would translate all uh, of the bad words, it, it, I wouldn't do good to the original because uh, it would seem like this is a horrible text and how could, uh, I mean, this is only, they, they're only uh, insulting each other and they don't because sometimes it's really tender what they say. Just, we, we wouldn't understand it if I translate Just don't ask literally. Google Translate. Uh, to <laughs> no. So, um, yeah, I think that, that was the most uh, difficult um, Apart from the the localism, so I uh, uh, had uh, a Mexican friend whom I could ask for some uh, words, even Spanish natives wouldn't uh, understand. And then sometimes my Mexican friend who comes from Oaxaca wouldn't know a, a word, and then I had to ask Fernanda because this word comes from Veracruz, or as she then told me, or from her family. Uh, so I invented so. <laughs> <laughs> so they, yeah, so so uh, uh, that's uh, of course in, in every translation you have to. Um, yeah, do this this kind of research and uh, yeah. Well, maybe maybe it's a good moment to stop talking about language and to actually hear it in use. And uh, Fernanda, would you mind reading an excerpt from yeah. from the book in in Spanish, and then we can sure. perhaps hear the I way think that we have to use this microphone. Yeah. Or just. <laughs> Temporada de huracanes. So this is the opening of the novel. Uno. Llegaron al canal por la brecha que sube del río, con las ondas prestas para la batalla y los ojos entornados, cosidos casi en el fulgor del mediodía. Eran cinco, y su líder, el único que llevaba traje de baño, una truza colorada que ardía entre las matas sedientas del cañaveral enano de principios de mayo. El resto de la tropa lo seguía en calzoncillos, los cuatro calzados en botines de fango, los cuatro cargando por turnos el balde de piedras menudas que aquella misma mañana sacaron del río, los cuatro ceñudos y fieros y tan dispuestos a inmolarse que ni siquiera el más pequeño de ellos se hubiera atrevido a confesar que sentía miedo, al avanzar con sigilo a la saga de sus compañeros, la liga de la resortera tensa en sus manos, el guijarro apretado en la banada de bandana de cuero, listo para descalabrar lo primero que le saliera al paso si la señal de la emboscada se hacía presente, en el chillido del vienteveo, reclutado como vigía en los árboles a sus espaldas, o en el cascabeleo de las hojas al ser apartadas con violencia, o el zumbido de las piedras al partir el aire frente a sus caras, la brisa caliente cargada de sopilotes etéreos contra el cielo casi blanco y de una peste que era peor que un puño de arena en la cara, un hedor que daban ganas de escupir para que no bajara las tripas, que quitaba las ganas de seguir avanzando. Pero el líder señaló el borde de la cañada, y los cinco agatas sobre la hierba seca, los cinco apiñados en un solo cuerpo, los cinco rodeados de moscas verdes reconocieron al fin lo que asomaba sobre la espuma amarilla del agua, el rostro podrido de un muerto entre los juncos y las bolsas de plástico que el viento empujaba desde la carretera, la máscara prieta que bullía en una miriada de culebras negras y sonreía. Man nannte sie die Hexe, wie ihre Mutter, Hexenmädchen, als die Alte ihr Geschäft mit dem Heilen und den Zaubersprüchen anfing und einfach nur Hexe, als sie allein zurückblieb, damals im Jahr des Erdrutschs. Sollte sie einmal einen anderen Namen gehabt haben, vielleicht festgehalten auf einem zerknitterten, wurmstichigen Zettel, von der Alten in einen der Schränke zwischen Tüten, schmutzstarrende Lumpen, ausgerissene Haarbüschel, Knochen und Essensreste gestopft, sollte sie einmal Vor- und Nachnamen besessen haben wie die übrigen Dorfbewohner, so hat niemand jemals davon erfahren. Nicht einmal die Frauen, die freitags ins Haus kamen, hatten je gehört, dass die Alte sie anders gerufen hätte. Immer nur, du dumme Gans, oder du Drecksgöre, oder verdammte Teufelsbrut, wenn die Alte wollte, dass das Mädchen zu ihr kommen oder den Mund halten, oder einfach nur still unter dem Tisch sitzen sollte, damit sie den Klagen der Frauen lauschen konnte, dem Stöhnen, mit dem sie ihre Sorgen, Beschwerden und schlaflosen Nächte würzten den Träumen von verstorbenen Angehörigen und dem Streit mit denen, die noch lebten. Und fast immer ging es um Geld oder den Ehemann oder dieses Hurenpack von der Landstraße. Und ich weiß nicht, warum sie mich immer verlassen, wenn ich am glücklichsten bin. Sie heulten. Wozu das alles? Sie schluchzten. Lieber sterbe ich gleich. 
Und mit dem Zipfel ihres Kopftuchs wischten sie sich das Gesicht ab, das sie verhüllten, sobald sie die Küche der Hexe verließen. Man wusste ja nie. So wie die Leute im Dorf tratschten. Sonst hieß es noch, dass man zur Hexe ging, weil man sich an jemanden rächen wollte. Dass man das Flittchen, das einem den Mann abluchsen wollte, mit einem Fluch belegte. Denn an Intrigantinnen fehlt es nie, wo man sich doch einfach nur ein Mittel gegen die Magenverstimmung seines idiotischen Sohns holte, der ganz allein ein Kilo Kartoffeln verdrückt hatte, oder ein Tee gegen die Müdigkeit oder eine Salbe für die Unpässlichkeiten des Unterleibs, oder sich bloß eine Weile in der Küche etwas von der Seele reden, den Kummer loswerden wollte, den Schmerz, der ihn hoffnungslos in der Kehle zappelte. Denn die Hexe hörte zu, und die Hexe konnte offenbar nichts erschüttern. Ja, es hieß sogar, dass sie ihren Mann umgebracht hatte, keinen geringeren als das Schlitzohr Man Malolo Conde. Ja, ja, und zwar des Geldes wegen, um an seine Kohle, sein Haus und seine Länder reinzukommen. An die 100 Hektar Feld- und Weideland, die ihm sein Vater vererbt hatte, also das, was noch übrig davon war, nachdem er fast alles stückchenweise an den Gewerkschaftsführer der Zuckerrohrfabrik verkauft hatte, um bloß nie arbeiten zu müssen, um von seinen Kapitalerträgen und seinen sogenannten Geschäften zu leben, die immer schief gingen. Aber das Anwesen war so groß, dass, als Don Manolo starb, immer noch ein guter Teil da war und auch noch einiges abwarf. Weshalb seine Söhne, zwei erwachsene Kerle mit abgeschlossener Ausbildung, die Don Manolo mit seiner rechtmäßigen Ehefrau drüben in Montiel Sosa gezeugt hatte, im Dorf auftauchten, kaum dass sie vom Tod des Vaters erfahren hatten. Ein jäher Herzinfarkt, hatte der Arzt von Villa gesagt, als die beiden zu diesem Haus inmitten der Zuckerrohrfelder kamen, wo die Totenwache abgehalten wurde. Und eben dort erklärten sie der Hexe vor aller Augen, dass sie sich bis zum nächsten Tag fortscheren sollte. Aus dem Haus und aus dem Dorf. Das ja wohl nicht ganz richtig im Kopf war, wenn sie glaubte, als Söhne würden sie es zulassen, dass eine dahergelaufene Schlampe das Erbe ihres Vaters an sich riss. Die Ländereien und das Haus. Nach all den Jahren war es immer noch beinahe ein Rohbau. So grandios und missraten wie Don Manolos Träume. Mit seiner geschwungenen Treppe, auf deren Gelände sich, auf deren Geländer sich Gipsengel tummelten und den mächtig hohen Decken, unter denen Fledermäuse nisteten, und dem Geld, das dort irgendwo versteckt sein musste. Ein Haufen Centenario-Goldmünzen, die Don Manolo von seinem Vater geerbt und nie zur Bank gebracht hatte. Und der Diamant, der Diamantring, den niemand je zu Gesicht bekommen hatte. Nicht einmal die Söhne, dessen Stein aber, so erzählte man sich, so groß war, dass man ihn für eine Fälschung hielt, eine echte Reliquie die Don Manolos Großmutter gehört hatte, Senora Chusita Villa Garbosa de los Monteros de Conde, und der allen irdischen wie göttlichen Gesetzen nach der Mutter der jungen Männer zustand, Don Manolos rechtmäßige Ehefrau vor Gott und den Menschen, und nicht dieser zugereisten Nutte, dieser kriecherischen Schlange, dieser Mörderin, dieser Hexe, die jetzt die feine Dame spielte. Dabei hatte Don Manolo die kleine Hure aus irgendeiner Dreckshütte im Wald geholt, um in der Einsamkeit der Hochebenen jemanden zu haben, an dem er seine niedersten Instinkte befriedigen konnte. Kurzum, eine schlechte Frau, die irgendwie, vielleicht hat es ihr der Teufel selbst eingeflüstert, glaubten manche, oben auf dem Berg ein Kraut gefunden hatte, zwischen den Ruinen, die, wie die von der Regierung sagten, Gräber der Vorfahren waren, die früher diese Gegenden bewohnt hatten, die zuerst hier gewesen waren, noch vor den Gattubines von Spanien. Aber die hatten das alles hier von ihren Schiffen aus gesehen und im Handumdrehen gehörte das Land der Krone von Kastilien. Und die paar Vorfahren, die noch übrig waren, mussten in den Bergen Zuflucht suchen und alles hinter sich lassen. Sogar die Steine ihrer Tempel, die beim Wirbelsturm 78 schließlich vom Berg bedeckt wurden, als der Erdrutsch über 100 Einwohner von La Matosa im Schlamm begrub und auch die Ruinen, zwischen denen dieses Kraut wuchs, aus dem die Hexe, sagte man, ein Gift braute, das man weder sah noch schmeckte und das keinerlei Spuren hinterließ. Denn sogar der Arzt von Villa erklärte, dass Don Manolo an einem Herzinfarkt gestorben sei. Doch die beiden dämlichen Söhne beharrten darauf, dass man ihn vergiftet hatte. Und die Leute gaben der Hexe später auch die Schuld am Tod von Don Manolos Söhnen, weil die noch am Tag der Beerdigung auf der Landstraße umkamen, als sie mit ihrem Auto den Leichenzug zum Friedhof von Villa anführten und sich von einem vor ihnen fahrenden Lastwagen an der Ladung Eisenstangen löste und beide erschlug. Auf den Fotos in der Zeitung war nur blutverschmiertes Eisen zu sehen. Eine schreckliche Sache. Keiner vermochte sich je zu erklären, wie dieser Unfall passieren konnte, wie die Stangen sich lösen, die Windschutzscheibe zerschmettern und die Insassen durchbohren konnten. Und mehr als einer nahm es zum Anlass, um die Hexe zu beschuldigen. Die Hexe hat ihnen einen Fluch angehängt, um Haus und Länder reinzubehalten. Das verdorbene Weib hat sich dem Teufel im Tausch gegen dunkle Mächte hingegeben. Und etwa zu dieser Zeit sperrte sich die Hexe in ihrem Haus ein und kam nicht mehr heraus. Weder tagsüber noch nachts. Vielleicht aus Angst vor der Rache der Kondes oder vielleicht, weil sie etwas zu verbergen hatte. Ein Geheimnis, das sie hüten musste. Irgendetwas in jenem Haus, das ihres Schutzes bedürfte. 
und sie wurde mager und blass. Ihr Blick allein war angsteinflößend und verwirrt. Und es waren die Frauen von Lamatosa, die ihr Essen brachten und dafür ihre Hilfe in Anspruch nahmen. Sich von ihr Mittelchen mischen, Tränke aus den Kräutern brauen ließen, die die Hexe selbst in ihrem Hinterhofgärtchen anpflanzte oder die auf dem Berg zu pflücken sie den Frauen auftrug. Damals, als es den Berg noch gab. I'd like to ask a question about collaboration, um, and uh, in part the, the collaboration between the two of you, but even more broadly, because as with Teju in his first novel, you've had this great good fortune uh, for, for this novel to be translated into several languages, some of which these translations, for example, into English are in progress or just wrapping up. And uh, I, thought I was quite amused by some of the things one could find on Twitter. Um, in both directions. On the one hand, for example, the English language translator marveling at, and I'm going to quote you uh, a tweet here, the riches of Mexico's Spanish potty mouth knows no comparison, and sometimes as a translator, I despair. But sometimes I remember that in English, unthinkingly, we do things like turn scared witless into scared shitless just because we can, and I think it's going to be okay. And it's not just in this one direction of this translator into English communicating her process um, among other translators uh, who follow her and respond to her, but it's also you have posed certain questions about idioms by way of social media and Twitter to the translators of different languages, correct? Yeah, I always uh, marvel at the things that uh, in one language we take for granted and, uh, and, and turns out to be really strange for, for other people who's trying to communicate that idea. And for example, uh, I think it was the, um, the um, uh, how do you say Hollandese is um, the, the, Dutch, uh, the Dutch language. Uh, they asked me what does, um, Oh my God, it's, uh, it's something, and you did ask it too, uh, about the phrase who's called uh, uh, Kim Pompo, for example. And it's just a, a line from a song, a really tropical song, a cumbia song. And uh, it's about, a, 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 it's a man who's asking the girl who buy, who buy her those shoes. And it's, it's a stupid song about, uh, I don't know, uh, yeah, and, and People use that phrase to, to ask it if they see you with, na with new shoes, it's like Kim Pompo, o sea, who, who, who give it to you? Even if you buy it yourself, it doesn't make sense. It is just like that, but it's, you know, in, in, in Mexican Spanish, I think the relationship with, with Spanish is it's a little bit complicated because um, the language was imposed into original Mexican habitants. So uh, we, as Mexicans, uh, have found a way of always turning the language and making its, its bite its own tail. And we are always playing and trying to say things in another form of uh, that same language. It's just, for example, um, uh, if I say for me, para mí, I will say also para Miguelito. Miguelito is a name, but Miguelito is also me. And or, or, or I don't know, we're always doing these silly jokes with, with the language and it can be also really um, strong and vulgar with sexual content also. But it's, uh, it's really difficult that to, to even to explain uh, sometimes from the translator. So I will show uh, Angelica some YouTube videos with the songs and she will give the, the flavor of that but into words that uh, uh, could be understandable. And with English, oh, it's also the same, the same way. I think uh, what I, I, I think I, I love Spanish. I think it's, but that always happened with one's mother tongue, uh, what one native tongue. It's, it's the best because it's yours, and at the same time, it's the worst for expressing what you must say because it, it's your tongue, it's your language. So you can. I think what, what we do in Mexico to turn always the meaning of uh, and, and, and searching uh, like sen new senses for all words, I think it's a, it's a form of resistance. It's like, okay, I have this language, but I'm going to do whatever I want with it, and I'm going to be creative to express the things I, I must. And 
I was, uh, I even uh, had a, not a discussion, but I, I saw so, so in social media, a person from Spain told me that my book promised a lot, but he didn't finish it because he thought he, it was written in Spanish. Because he said that uh, what I spoke wasn't Spanish, it was Mexican or something like that. So I think, well, I think it's, it's uh, Spanish is beautiful because it's, it requires more effort to not understand between Argentinians, Costa Ricans, Mexicans, uh, Mexican-Americans, for example, Spaniards, then it, it is more complicated not to be understood than to be understood, and I think it's beautiful. And also when I was in Vienna, uh, uh, I have a reader also in German, and, and uh, a gentleman from the audience just stand up and, and said that he was a little bit offended because it, it was, Northern German uh, uh, language. It, it was translated into, and I, I and, and I said I'm totally agree with you because as a Mexican, I have to read a lot of uh, literature written in Spanish from Spain. I'm just imagining the, the, the German <laughs> publishers who are here today, if, if they're, they're willing to follow this model that you often find, for example, in Brazil and Portugal, yeah. they're two different, different translations. translations. And so I wonder if we need to now have like a Schweiz or Übersetzung. So and I said to the gentleman, <laughs> of course, I totally understand you. I wish there was also a BN1 translation of, um, of uh, Hurricane Season. Why not? Anyway, so uh, I think it's, it's, uh, translation is beautiful because it connects. It, it, uh, I read a lot of uh, books, trans translated books in, in, my, in my infancy when I was a child. And uh, I think it's uh, great to have the possibility of enter in one author's mind and not to worry about, oh, did he really meant that or he was using. No, and that's, that's the job of the translator. And I think it's beautiful because it just makes the things work for us. And that's the way it must be. Well, for example, and I wonder about you, did you by any chance communicate with translators into the other languages? You lived in Paris for 10 years. That doesn't necessarily mean that you would be in touch with the translator into French. Have you communicated with other people working on the novel at, at all, or has it been largely? No, no um, usually, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, if there's not some kind of uh, official reuni reunion or some um, get together, uh, we, we are not really in contact with uh, the translators to the other languages. I was in contact with uh, Fernanda and that was a nice collaboration uh, because it was very funny and, and, and open, and, um, but otherwise, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, a little bit earlier, I, I said something that, like, along the lines of, we, you know, you've had the great good fortune to be translated into many other languages. And since we're wrapping up now, I should, I'd actually like to turn that phrase around and say that we have the great good fortune uh, to receive this novel in German in the edition published by Wagenbach. And so I would like to make sure that everybody who is here tonight sees that over there, that there is a stand with books, lots of books, all of the books from the shortlist. And I think we're fortunate to have Saison der Werbestürmer, and, and perhaps you can buy your copy, and perhaps you can even get it signed by the two winners of the prize. And I assume this is a rare opportunity in Berlin, um, that one from Barcelona, one from Mexico City. Um, and, uh, but also as well, there are the other titles on the shortlist, which I think open up new ways and exhilarating ways for all of the darkness in the matter that they communicate, um, or often communicate, not all of them, but there really is joy and in delight, I think, in what they bring, what they do to German, what these books through the translators have done to expand the range of what is possible, not just for other writers in German, but I think for readers of German as well. And I'm very grateful to the publishers, Wagenbach, the publishers of the other shortlist. I know I speak for the rest of the jury ourselves, and perhaps Maybe this is a moment to acknowledge the 100 plus books that we read that were also outstanding um, in a year of uh, just extraordinary uh, reading, I think, for, for, for all of us. Uh, it was not, this is part of the reason it was so difficult uh, to suddenly have to reduce things to six. Um, but yes, all of that is, is a way of um, perhaps moving towards the final phase of the party, or the first phase of the party, and uh, maybe a round of applause for Fernanda and Angelica in appreciation for their wonderful book. <laughs>